car alarm. Outside the bank, a Mercedes-Benz tells one in a group of teenage boys, he's too close to the vehicle. Please step back. He does, and the car says, thank you. A bolder boy decides to press things, rubs his thigh against the vehicle. The car says, you have stepped inside the perimeter. Step back. But some girls have gathered, so the boy crosses his arms, stays right where he is. The car starts to count down from five. The boy doesn't move. Thank you, says the car at zero, and the boy turns, gouges the metallic finish with a key, while another kicks the tires and a third jumps on the hood. All the while the car says, You are too close to the vehicle. Please step back. The girls scatter. The boys follow. A straggler twists the antenna. Thank you, says the car. Thank you. Thank you. A woman comes out of the bank and looks crazily around. Someone she hasn't seen in years. Someone with a great patience whom she may have dreamt of last night or loved at 17. Someone she knows and can't quite place has spoken just now here in the street. This is the first thing in a long time of which she is certain. Day-nighter. Inside the Toronto-Montreal train, a dark-haired woman drags her suitcase down the aisle. From where I sit, she appears life-sized, but when she steps into the rainy night under the sign that reads Cornwall, she's greeted by two tiny parents. The tiny dad grabs her large suitcase. It must be so heavy. And she follows, towering over them in her voluminous down coat like some terrible freak duckling. All through Ontario, I see this scene repeated. Big lugs like linebackers on steroids put on their Queen's engineering jackets, step out into Home with the Folks for Christmas, suddenly gross. Where will the parents put them in such tiny houses, tiny beds? They'll stoop to enter their childhood rooms, accidentally crush the family dog. But each time they trail the shrunken couples to cars in the adjacent lots, just before the train pulls out, as they're talking, parents appraising them or announcing what's for dinner. The giants are bending to their tiny parents, already becoming smaller. House Sitter, 4 a.m. Pool hopping, says the younger cop. Used to do it myself as a kid. I stare past the blur of uniform across the dimly lit lawn. Two plastic garden chairs bob in the shallow end, drawn close, conversant. All night I've listened to laughter, to the sleek glissando of furtive swimmers. I felt ridiculous, alone in the house, keyed to every sound, finally phoning the cops from inside a locked bathroom, then cruising room to room like a watchful cat. Now the porch light burns. The absent owner's cat digs in his litter. Each grain of sand flies with the pitch and force of flung glass. Glass house. Invisible swimmers who scale six-foot fences. They must be asleep by now, spooned around each other, hair still damp on the sheets. Or maybe they've moved a few blocks down, lie seal-like on the beach, dreaming, inches from the tide. The pool's circulating pump sends water over the edge as I go barefoot on wet grass, kneel and angle for the chairs. In water, they're so heavy, resistant as bodies. For a second, I even see hair billow out 
as I haul the last one in. I am that tired, that sick with desire. The woman downstairs used to be beautiful. This summer she's grown huge, a ham with legs. She lumbers below, watering the garden with a hose. From my balcony, the evening light seems kind to the extra flesh, soft on her print shift, the scarf that holds back her dark hair. And for once, I want to believe she's not unhappy, not stuffing her face to fill in the distance between her and the unusually thin husband who travels, not hiding in the body of a proverbial fat woman passed in the street without notice. Instead, that she wants to be of consequence, clearly visible to her small son stationed on their balcony, that he never lose sight of such a broad floral back, thinks she might leave him vanish in the leaves below. But the wail that comes from him is a thin, unwavering cry, as if he never comes up for air, this wordless child siren of come back, not enough, too far, that has brought me and gradually other neighbors onto our balconies to look first on a small boy who, 30 years from now, will turn his life over, say, there was always too much of her, she swallowed me up, and then down on a fat woman, breathlessly bending. Timing your run. The night before there was a break-in at your store. There was an afternoon when the lock had been fixed and you'd said you'd drop an extra key at Laurent's place after work. There was a call from your wife. All day you'd waited to run, but just as you went out, it really started pouring. You were like a little boy in the rain, Albert Moss said, and you came back drenched, pleased with your time. There was a pair of New Balance trainers for a customer with narrow feet the rain on the shoulders of the UPS man who waited while you signed. A tuna sandwich made for you at the dépanneur next door, your thin fingers on the brown paper bag. There was a blue car. There was what you said about this run of bad luck, robberies at the store, a fire on New Year's Day, about training for a comeback in the fall, believing everything could turn around. How happy the woman with long, narrow feet was when you called to say her shoes were in. There was your hand, hours after dark, slipping the extra key through Laurent's mail slot, Laurent asleep. There was a car coming. The key lay on the floor all night, After running, you showered in the store's tiny bathroom. There was the bar of soap, still wet. There was a blue car slicing a corner. There was your black car stopped at the light. There was Laurent, awake in the morning, a freshly cut key on the cool floor. There is tonight's news footage of you winning races, explaining the difference between two kinds of heel cups, bending a shoe as you speak. There was the key you wanted Laurent to have in case something happened. There is Laurent, half asleep, picking it up. Who we are now. The man who runs the parking lot at St. Hubert and Duluth holds our keys in one closed hand, curses this country with the other. In Soviet Union, I am doctor, like Chekhov, his fifth identity in the last six months. Here I clean hospital after midnight. You must pick up keys by 11. My friends plan their lives in a nearby Greek restaurant, plan subject to jobs, lovers, children, or lack of same. Most of all, 
this constant gnawing at who we are, exactly what we're supposed to be doing here. After the meal, the wine, strong Greek coffee, a ballpoint meanders on the paper tablecloth. Variations on the same story, each year less embellishment. I've seen him wave off customers he didn't like the look of. In Greece, I am anthropologist, he barks, shaking his fist at a blue chevette that is backed out in search of a meter. Quebec people are racist. Canadians are worse. I do not think, he says, squinting at us, that you are pure Canadian. When we finally head home in our reclaimed vehicles, it is always early April, always snowing, always unseasonal. We huddle in the glow of the car's dials and gauges, stare into the red light at Cherrier like some kind of second sun, longing for sleep, for dreams to redeem us. I am Armenian, he states proudly, and this place is dead. In Moscow, my cousin has 14 fruit stores. He thrusts the wrong keys at us. I point to the correct hook. East Europe is living. Next year, I sell antibiotics in Bucharest. Good business, he says, releasing our keys. Good night. <laughs>